Okay, well, let's turn our attention to his word here this morning. We'll begin this morning. We'll begin here in Hebrews chapter 11. If you want to turn to verse 23, we'll do a little bit of review here in Hebrews 11, starting in verse 23. I'm curious this morning how many of you, and you can show me your hands if you're willing to be transparent and vulnerable, how many of you fear at times? It's okay. There we go. A lot of hands up, right? Yeah, some hands waving. Yes, yes, this is me. This is confession time, right? I've been waiting to get this off my chest. I fear. We fear a lot, okay? And as I prayed here this morning, as we sang this morning, what fitting songs. I didn't pick those songs. Gave the worship team as they sought the Lord, laid those songs on their hearts. And uh, so appropriate this morning as we consider uh, verse 27 specifically. We fear, let's be honest with ourselves, there are times, and some of us, maybe because you've been walking with the Lord for a longer period of time, you fear less. But yet at times, fear still comes in and grips your heart. What we need to recognize here, first off, you can write this one down. Listen, faith does not fear, okay? Faith doesn't fear. If our faith is functioning well, if our faith is strong, if our faith is healthy, it doesn't fear. Now, that's not to say when we do have fear in our lives that, well, we're just miserable failures. We can be honest and say, no, the enemy seeks to play on our fears. Our flesh is still alive. That's why we need to crucify it daily, But we do fear, we have anxiety, but what we need to remember is that those things are not from the Lord. Fear is not from the Lord. Consistently throughout Scripture we see and we read, do not fear. Do not fear. We also see in other places where we're to fear God and we know that in the the original language there, what that speaks of is it's a healthy fear, it's a reverence. It's an appreciation for, it's an an awareness of how amazing God is. But fear, when it comes to worry and anxiety and doubt, those things are from the enemy. And we're called to have faith that does not fear. We've been making our way through Hebrews chapter 11. And, and we've been, as we know, we've been making our way very slowly through this chapter. And of course, that's been intentional. Listen, I could teach through Hebrews chapter 11 and it would be, it would be a, a, a great time in the Word if we just made our way quickly through it. We would see the, the names of so many different individuals and the, and, and, and the, the faith that, that they demonstrated. And it would certainly serve as an encouragement to us. But I believe the Lord wants us to spend some time really considering this chapter right now, right at this time here in the year 2020, as we're considering things for our church body. And, and as we go through this chapter and we, we read of individuals, whether that be um, Abel or, or Enoch or, or Noah or Abraham or Moses, that we need to give some attention to the lives that they lived. As we consider the fact that they were great heroes of the faith, they demonstrated great faith, we must consider why. What was it about their lives? Because I believe that the Lord is calling us to a place where we will have to demonstrate great faith. Some of you already have in your lives. It's not over yet. It wasn't a one-time thing. It's not just once that you have to step out in faith and go, okay, I'm good. Everything else is going to be easy now for the rest of my life. You're going to continue to be called deeper and deeper. More uncomfortable at times where you have to have faith. You have to trust in God. And I believe that he is doing something in this church and working something in this church that is going to require us as a body corporately to demonstrate faith. It's going to require individuals to demonstrate faith. The ladies on on, uh, Tuesday evening and, and Thursday morning, they're going through the book of James. There's much that's said about faith in the book of James. God is working this in our lives. We know based off of the context of the book of Hebrews that they were preparing to face great persecution and they were fearing. They were fearing that persecution and the author of Hebrews brings them to a place of essentially saying, don't fear, trust, have faith in God. And and as we've considered even over the past couple weeks, those of you in your life groups on Wednesday night, I suspect you dealt with some of this, the idea of suffering, the idea of persecution, that we may face that even, even more intensely in our own country in, in years to come should the Lord tarry in His return. And, and if that's the case, we'll be called to demonstrate faith, to trust. This is a lesson we need to learn. And here as we've come into the account of Moses, let's read together here in verses 23 through 27. We've already been through 23 through 26. We read, by faith, Moses, when he was born, 
was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. We saw there the faith of his parents, not the faith of Moses, but the faith of parents that had the, that had the strength to stand up against the command of a king. Amram and Jochebed, two obscure individuals in Scripture. If I didn't say their names several times over the last few weeks, some of you may not have even recognized who those people were, and that's okay. I'm not faulting you for that. I think it's, I think it's very poetic of the Lord to have two individuals who, who, who played such a significant role in biblical history, and, and for all intents and purposes, they all but disappear off the pages of Scripture. But yet they had faith that saved a nation. By faith, Moses, verse 24, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That takes faith to say, I'm going to give up title. I'm going to give up responsibility of a throne. I'm going to give up royalty. I'm going to give up riches. I'm going to choose suffering instead. That takes faith. It takes faith that believes in a promise, that takes faith, that looks at something that's a future promise and it becomes a present reality. It becomes so real in your life that you're able to live by it and to believe in it. He esteemed, verse 26, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. Here, Moses, uh, hundreds of years before Christ, the author says here that he identified with Christ. Before he even, before Christ, God incarnate, comes to the scene, Moses esteems the reproach of Christ. That is, he's looking forward. He knew, he knew there was someone greater who would come. He knew there would be a deliverer. He knew there would be a Messiah. And he chose to identify with him, even if that meant his own reproach, even if that meant his own suffering. That required faith. And now we see here this morning in verse 27, we read, By faith he forsook Egypt. Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What we see here once again is that faith does not fear. In faith, he forsook Egypt, he left it, he said it's gone. But this should cause us to question a little bit here this morning if we're familiar with the text, if we're familiar with what we've read in Exodus chapter 2, reading here that by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing, it should cause us to question a little bit, is that really the case with Moses? Now, it appears here that the author of Hebrews has been looking at Moses' life chronologically. And it might be the case that this leaving Egypt here was in fact the time shortly after the killing of the Egyptian and Moses' sin being found out that he flees from Egypt. Some commentators believe that that's what the author is referencing here. But I have a little bit of a problem with that. And I want us to turn this morning, if you would, look to Exodus chapter 2 where we've kind of been bouncing back and forth between here this morning. Look to Exodus chapter 2 and specifically verses 11 through 15. Read along with me here and see if you catch it. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Look at it here. So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Verse 15, When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. When we read that account here, here in this passage, something stands out to me that seems to be a contradiction. In verse 14, we read, So Moses feared, and this fear led to his fleeing from Egypt. So you might ask, what's the deal here? I don't know, I don't believe necessarily that verse 27 is referring to this time when Moses fled Egypt. 
As I said, commentators disagree on this point. Uh, I think Moses fleeing Egypt that first time is really wrapped up in him esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the pleasures of Egypt. I think it's kind of combined in that, that here he identified with the Hebrew people. He took action on something. Granted, he was wrong in what he did. But by choosing God over the things of the world, by identifying with the Hebrew people, and then being forced to flee the land, that was him. And that was the result of his actions uh, that were happening there. This forsaking Egypt now that we read in verse 27 and not fearing the wrath of the king, I believe will be that second time that we see Moses leave Egypt. This is the time when he leads his people out of Egypt, when he delivers by the strength of God the nation Israel from Egypt. I believe it's the second transition, second trip out of Egypt, if you will, that shows us this, this point in his life when he does not fear the king. The J.B. Phillips New Testament translation reads uh, as follows. By faith, he led the exodus from Egypt. He defied the king's anger with the strength that came from obedience to the invisible king. Now, here should be the next question for us this morning, and it should be an encouragement to us. If Moses fled Egypt, if he fled the first time in fear after the act of killing the Egyptian was known, and then he spends the better part of 40 years living his life out in the desert, living as a shepherd, working as a shepherd, you might wonder then, if he left the first time in fear, and then the second time he came and in boldness led his people to freedom, what changed? What changed in his life? What caused Moses, after all that time, to return and without fear lead the greatest supernatural rebellion that this world has ever known? The answer is found in Exodus chapter 3, and we'll consider that here this morning. Let's begin here, and, and so just you know, turn the page, or go to the bottom of the page there. Let's pick up in chapter 3 and verse 1. Moses is now, he's out of Egypt. He's been uh, living uh, in the land of Midian uh, for many years now. And we read, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Forty years roughly had now passed since Moses chose to identify with the people of God and reject the life of royalty. He was a shepherd now, tending sheep in the desert. And I want you to consider for a moment, one moment Moses is in a position of great power, wealth, of tremendous resources at his disposal. And then he begins to question life. He begins to question his path, his purpose. He recalls the teaching of his mother, the faith of his parents. He makes a choice to follow God. And suddenly, all those things that he knew are gone. He's now a shepherd in the desert. Anybody ever been there before? Maybe not literally a shepherd in the desert, but you kind of felt like one. You took action on what you believed God was calling you to, and it just didn't seem to turn out quite the way that you expected. There's a lot we can learn from Moses in this time in his life. You know, perhaps Moses was enjoying this current time in his life. That can happen too, that for some of us, it's, it's less about the fact that suddenly we're just out in the desert alone, and it's, it's more that we're thinking, finally, I'm out in the desert alone. That thing that I thought I was going to have to do, that God was calling me to, oh, thank goodness that didn't happen. That was terrifying, right? I don't know, for you, you may be, you may be thrilled to be in that place, or you may be thinking, why in the world am I here? Moses seems like he kind of was enjoying his life a good bit. He was in hiding, and I can relate to that. I think it's a lesson to all of us of how sometimes our plans don't quite turn out the way we think they're going to. And again, maybe some of you are experiencing this today. Life has perhaps not quite turned out like you thought it would. That word you heard from the Lord maybe has yet to find its fulfillment. I think for Moses, there had to have been. A lingering question. What of his people that he began to have a heart for, that he identified with? What of their deliverance? What of of this divine plan and this purpose for his life that he was told about from a young age? When would it come to fulfillment? When would God's plan finally come to fruition? 
Would it ever come to fruition? We read here in verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. You see, it is often in the most seemingly mundane of times and circumstances when we least expect it that God shows up. This moment would prove to be a pivotal moment in the life of Moses. Out of nowhere, on the backside of a mountain, it was just another day, and here comes an encounter with God. Let me tell you, Christian, you can never expect when you're going to have an encounter with God. And those are powerful moments. Some of you, you've had pivotal moments with God. Incredible encounters where God shook your world. When He woke you up in the middle of the night and it seemed as if He spoke to you almost audibly. When He brought about a circumstance in your life and and maybe it was an extreme circumstance. Maybe it was a near-death experience or maybe it was just a circumstance that was incredibly painful and you didn't see it coming. But all of a sudden you're in this place and you're having this encounter with God. He's speaking to you perhaps more clearly than you've ever heard Him speak before. And He wakes you up to the things that He wants to do in your life. This was what was about to happen in the life of Moses. You know, Henry Blackaby, and many of you know this book, it's one of my favorites, in his book, Experiencing God. If you've, never, if you've never read Experiencing God, I'd encourage you to. He writes of seven realities that are true in the life of a believer who desires to know and to experience God. The first, he says, is that God is always at work around you. Please understand that this morning. Despite whether you see it, know it, believe it, doesn't change whether or not God is actively at work around you. He is. He is at work. God is at work in this community. God is at work in this church. God is always at work around you. Number two, he says, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. He pursues you. He wants a relationship with you. Number three, God invites you to join Him in His work. He invites you to join Him in His work. If God is always at work around us, that means that He's always at work around us. And as we seek to be involved in that work, it comes through an invitation to you saying, come and and join me in this work. Number four, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. Number five, and these, number five, and I would say number six, these are big ones for us. Number five says, God's invitation for you to join Him always leads to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. For you to join God in the work that He is doing, it will inevitably require of you a crisis of belief. Something that brings you to a place of saying, do I really trust this? Am I really going to do this? Am I really going to step out in faith and do something that everybody else thinks is crazy or radical? And when you make the decision to do that, then comes number six. You must make major adjustments in your life To join God in what He is doing. Rarely, if ever, does God allow you to join Him in the work that He is doing without requiring some adjustment from you. But you see, we don't like that because we're too comfortable. And that's because we're a product of the country in which we live. Let's just be honest about it, okay? We don't need to knock our country. We don't need to apologize for it. Sometimes maybe we do, right? And the things that we find ourselves just drawn to and we need to repent of it. But at the end of the day, listen, we are where we are. But understand that because we are where we are, it may require more discomfort from you, more sacrifice from you to truly join God in the work that He's endeavoring to do. And number seven, you come to know God and experience Him as you obey Him and He accomplishes His work through you. Remember, faith obeys. And when we obey in faith, that's when we begin to truly experience God and come to know Him in a deeper and more intimate and personal way. 
I don't know about you guys, but I want more of that. And as we look at the life of Moses here, what we see is that Moses was about to receive an invitation that would lead to a crisis of faith. It would require major adjustments in his life. In fact, it would require it for the duration of his life. For the rest of his life, nothing that he had grown accustomed to over the past 40 years would ever be the same again. It would require great obedience, but it would lead to an incredible experience of knowing God personally. Here, the angel of the Lord, it says, the angel of the Lord, this is most likely a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ that's appearing to him in the fire of this burning bush. This bush that was not consumed. It begins to beckon to Moses. In verse 3, we read, then Moses said, I will turn, excuse me, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. This, of course, is Moses' own commentary. We're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He writes, he narrates what's happening here. And I can only imagine that this wasn't quite exactly how it went down. That here in this moment, he says, no, I'll turn this way and go see what this is all about. I have to imagine in this moment, he had to be thinking, holy smokes, do you see that? You know, he was out there as a shepherd amongst his sheep. Shepherds were known after spending a lot of time out in the desert to sort of begin to talk to their sheep, you know? I'm not knocking him for that. I absolutely would have. It'd be like, hey, Fluffy, do you, do you see that over there? Am I losing my mind right now? Right? Because here's the thing. There was something spectacular about this burning bush. And you might think, yeah, that's obvious. It was a burning bush. In the desert, a really hot desert, bushes were known to burn, okay? There were bushes out there that would spontaneously combust. What was the difference here? Those bushes would burn up and be gone. You know, growing up up in Michigan, not that it doesn't happen down here, but especially in Michigan, during the wintertime, you're approaching Christmas, what do you do? You go out and you buy a Christmas tree, okay? A real one. Sap, smell and all. You even maybe cut that thing down if you're feeling extra manly, right? You're going to go out and, and, and find the good old-fashioned Christmas tree. And then, through the course of the holidays, it, it begins to dry up and die, Okay? And then you take it outside. And if you live out in the country like we did, you toss it out there and you know one of these days it's going to make a fantastic bonfire. And you just wait and that thing begins to turn brown and you just get all excited and you go out and you throw that big old Christmas tree and you don't chop it up. No, what you do is you prop it up right in the fire pit and you toss in a match. And it's amazing. You guys are thinking I'm a pyro right now, but this was a lot of fun, okay? For a kid, it was like you threw in the match and... And then it was just gone. Just like that, it was gone. That was the difference here for Moses as he's looking at this bush. As he's thinking, it's not being consumed. It's not going anywhere. And so he says, I got to get closer. I got to see this. I got to understand this. So verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Look here. God did not speak. I want you to understand this here. God did not speak to Moses until he had his attention. Do you understand that? You see, it wasn't until Moses chose to come closer and to listen and to receive the word of God that God had for him that God began to speak. And so it is often with us. Listen, the burning bush was certainly something emotional out in the desert. You can only imagine that if it hadn't really gotten Moses' attention, he would have been able to tell a great story of this incredible thing that he saw. And oh, it really moved me. It was quite this experience. It was this amazing thing I've never seen before. And we want oftentimes our relationship with the Lord. We want our worship experiences. We want our time at church to be just that. A burning bush that gets us really excited and we just walk away and go, Wow, did you experience that today? But you see, there's more to it than that. God wants our attention, folks. He wants us to look and to go, I need to know more. 
I need to experience more. I've got to get closer. I've got to feel the presence of whatever is happening here. And when we do that, when we give God our attention, when we look at that, 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 that pivotal moment, if it's the burning bush or if it's anything else, and we go, God, I see you in this and I want to know more. What is it that you have to say to me, Lord, that we draw closer? And that, when He has our attention, is the place that He begins to speak to us. We've got to go deeper. And so as he comes closer here, God cries out to him and says, Moses, Moses. He doesn't say his name just once. He says it twice. And we see throughout Scripture where when God calls people, he often calls their name more than once. And this speaks to urgency. It speaks to importance. It should grab our attention. Listen, if today I said, Carlos, Carlos, and I say it a second time, I got Carlos' attention now. So often with my own children, as they, as they grow up, we say their name once, and what happens? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. But I say it again, and all of a sudden I've got their attention, maybe three, four, five times, you know? And here's the thing. I often go, did you hear me call your name the first time? Yes. <laughs> but that's the way we are. We need our name sometimes to be spoken twice, to get our attention. He cries out to him, and Moses says, here I am. Or maybe it was like, here I am. I'm right here. <laughs> but he's got his full attention. In verse 5 we read, Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. You see, Moses would eventually develop a relationship with God that we can only begin to imagine. It was said that Moses was a friend of God. That he spoke with him, as it were, face to face. As someone speaks to a friend. This is what the scripture says about Moses and his relationship with God. At one point Moses was given the privilege of seeing just a portion of the glory of God. And the time that he spent there with him, it changed him. It changed his countenance. People knew that he looked different. His face was glowing because he had spent time in intimacy with the Lord. Yet despite such an intimate and close relationship, it should be noted here that began, it began with an incredible sense of reverence for who God was. Folks, let's not miss this here. It is right for us to desire His presence, to draw close to Him. But as we do, as we, as we desire His presence, may we not forget that He is a holy and righteous God. That our, abil- our ability to boldly approach His throne, that it was purchased at a price. To go beyond the veil, to know Him personally, it did not come without sacrifice. I fear we are in the church today much too flippant in our relationship with Christ. That it oftentimes lacks the reverence, the fear of a healthy awareness of who God is. And that though He is perhaps more personal to us today, because of the work of Christ, He is still the I Am. He is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is still the one who is seated on the throne and is above all things. And yes, He meets us right where we are. But we ought to come before Him in humility. And we see that here with Moses. Verse 6, it says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Listen, this morning as you seek the Lord, as as you maybe are are endeavoring to hear from the Lord, you you believe he's putting something on your heart as well. I want to ask you this morning, it's not about being dogmatic about this, but do you kneel in prayer? Before Him? Do you close your eyes in worship? Do you raise your hands? Do you find yourself at times weeping in His presence? Tell me, what is your emotion as it relates to you approaching the Lord? I'm not asking for your dramatic displays. I'm not asking for you to muster something up just for the sake of the activity. But what I am asking you is, is, do you... Do you seek the Lord and have the sense when you do that you are on holy ground? And I would say to you that if you don't, if you are not at times moved beyond yourself, 
If you're not in awe at times, then I would, I would challenge you that you haven't truly experienced his presence. And you ought to seek it. In verse 7 we read, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Listen, friends, God, God knows Okay, what do we take from this here? God knows. I don't know what was going through the heart of Moses. I can't imagine that he didn't at times think, as I mentioned earlier, about his people and and what was going on with them. And you may be wondering, when is God going to see this? Or or, or when maybe it relates to you personally. Lord, I have abilities. I have ideas. I have gifts. I want to use it. Listen, don't think for a second that God doesn't know what's going on, that He doesn't know the plight of His people, that He doesn't know how He might use you or use somebody else. Don't think for a second that God doesn't have a plan. We read in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow or slack, as some of your translations may read, in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There's a principle that we see there as it relates to God, that His time, His ways are not ours. We also see that God said here in this passage, So I have come down to deliver them. In Jeremiah 29, 11, a passage of scripture that many people cling to, we see a promise that was very much at that time in its initial fulfillment to the nation of Israel. And it continues to this day. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, those seven realities of experiencing God remind us that God is always at work around us, accomplishing His plan of salvation. And guess what? He invites us to join Him in that work. That's an incredible privilege. But here's the thing. He doesn't need us. He doesn't. He delights in using us. And so He calls us. And He commissions us. And He equips us. To carry out his plan and purpose. And they will be carried out. How awesome is that? And and so then we see here Moses is commissioning in verse 10. Come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh. That you may bring my people the children of Israel out of Egypt. We're just doing a few more verses here so bear with me. Here is the calling on Moses' life. After roughly 80 years. 40 in Egypt now 40 in the wilderness. His calling comes. It now begins to become clear here in this burning bush moment. And listen, they are not Moses' people. They are God's people. And he's calling Moses, inviting him into his work. It's always important, guys, as you're considering aspects of ministry, as you're considering what you feel God may have called you to, as maybe you have the opportunity to serve in a ministry and you pour yourself into it, it's always important to remember who it all belongs to. Ministry, people, possessions, gifts, they're all the Lord's. They're all the Lord's. And in verse 11 we read, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Forty years earlier, Moses saw an Egyptian man meeting a Hebrew slave. He looked around and he took matters into his own hands, and he killed him. Moses believed he could do that. After all, he had been called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And the next day, he sees two Hebrew men fighting and he attempts to to break it up. At this point, likely Moses has been considering the fact that he's going to make a decision to identify with the Hebrew people. He's probably convinced himself, look at myself, look at me. I'm a war hero. I'm the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at all the things I've accomplished. Look at the resume that I've built up. And Lord, I'm hearing from you. And yes, I'm going to step out in faith and we're going to do this. And I'm going to lead these people out of Egypt. 
And you see, much of that was Moses' flesh. He wasn't ready to lead the people out of Egypt yet. And so here he comes along, two Hebrew men that are fighting, and he attempts to break it up because he's thinking, hey, I'm, I'm your leader. I'm like you guys. And they say, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Are you going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? And he flees. He says, oh my gosh. I'm not the man I thought I was. And he takes off. And now 40 years, a stranger in the land, as it were, working a job that is arguably less than what he was created and called for. And then he comes to a place where now he's ready to hear. Moses shows us that he's now in a place of proper humility as he asks, who am I? And you see, this is the place we need to be in for God to truly use us. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 says, My strength is made perfect in weakness. God chooses the weak and the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Listen, you think you're something? You think you've earned a reputation that gives you credibility? If it's not rooted in Christ, if it's not from Him, then it's nothing. It's all the work of your flesh. How could Moses be a deliverer if he had not been delivered himself? How can I today or any day stand before you and preach Christ crucified if I don't understand even a sliver of that crucifixion myself? As we studied in life groups this past week around the need for suffering, to to joy in suffering, to delight in it. Why? Because when we do, we're identified with Christ. We begin to understand and from that comes an authenticity, a a genuineness that allows us to truly minister to other people. If I know nothing of suffering, if I know nothing of persecution, how can I preach it? Moses chose to reject the things of the world and he found reproach and suffering and over time God brought him to a place of humility so that he could be used. Ray Ortland in a recent article wrote of the danger of pastors who quickly rise to fame writing that I quote, I have seen highly gifted young men crash and burn and lose years of ministry because their platform exceeded their character. You see, Moses was at risk of having a platform that had exceeded his character. He wasn't ready And the same principle applies for any one of us that desire to be used by God in a mighty and powerful way. Is the desire right? Yes, it is if it's for His glory. But if you're not ready, be cautious. And so he said, listen, what did did Moses ask? Moses said to God, who am I that I should go? Let's see how God answers in verse 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses asks God, who am I? And in our culture today, when such a question is posed, how do we want to answer it? Oh, let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you how special you are. Let me tell you how gifted you are. Let me build you up and build you up. And listen, I'm not saying that there's not a time for encouragement. But here we see how God answered this question. He didn't seek to tell Moses who he was. What he told Moses, the question that he answered was the right question. He says, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. God answered the right question. God took Moses' focus off of himself, off of his inadequacy, off of his failures, and he put Moses' focus back on God. And said, I'm calling you to this. I will be with you. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. And he took it a step further. And Moses said to God, indeed, what I, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And I think this is a good question on the part of Moses. Okay, and when I go, what do I tell them? And in verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. You see, God answers Moses' question here by telling him, you tell him I am sent you. 
This is a title often used of God throughout Scripture. It's connected with the name Yahweh. And it captures much of who God is. Namely, that He is a God. He is the God. The only God. That He's above all things. That He's not dependent on anything or anyone else. That He's not made. He's eternally existent in three persons. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-sufficient. That He was the one who would go with Moses. He is the one who also goes with you, Christian. And so as we close today, I want to read for you this verse once again. Verse 27 of Hebrews 11. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Faith does not fear. Why? Because I am who I am is with you. It doesn't matter who you are. What you are, what you are not, what you were, it matters that you are a child of the Most High God, covered by the blood of the Lamb, that He is with you. When we keep our eyes on Him and His promises, we can endure, as it says here, that Moses endured as seeing Him who is invisible. In 2 Corinthians 12.10, the very next verse, For the sake of Christ, then, the Apostle Paul says, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He will fulfill His purposes for you if you surrender to Him. Charles Spurgeon writes this, and I'm going to invite Nathan to close us, or David, excuse me, to close us in, uh, in just a short part of the song here this morning. Victoria, you can come too, whatever the plan is. Charles Spurgeon says this, Where is there an instance of God's beginning any work and leaving it incomplete? Show me for once, he says, a world abandoned and thrown aside, half-formed. Show me a universe cast off from the great potter's wheel with the design and outline, the clay half-hardened, and the form unshapely from incompleteness. The implication is there is that nowhere, nowhere do you see that. God will, com- he will complete his work. He will finish what he has started. But I wonder, what is God calling you to? Are you giving him your attention so that you may hear? Are you actively pursuing His presence, worshiping Him in humility and reverence? Do you know Him such that you know who you are? Are you ready to step out in faith, trusting that He will be with you, enduring through the inevitable trials because you see Him? If so, if that's you, if you've come to that place then I would submit to you that you have faith that does not fear and that you're ready for something radical, you're ready for something beyond you. And I believe that the Lord wants to bring us all to that place.